Hello, I'd like to talk you through a PowerPoint that is all about ways of changing scenery. So if you would just take a moment and think about some of the ways that we can change scenery. The book lists quite a few, but take a few minutes and, and ponder it. Well, maybe not minutes, give it a second. Might even wanna take some notes as we go through this, but Let's take a look at some options because you're probably pondering a few. The easiest probably and most direct is to carry things on and off the stage. And this can really be done by crew or by actors. And depending on the show and how visible those changes are, oftentimes scene changers that the crew are dressed to look like the actors in the show. So they fit in, not just somebody wearing black. In the old days, sets were constructed with fabric covered flats. And so a lot of the textbooks, ours included, discuss different ways of moving flats. And one of them is running a flat, of course, and walking them up, I think is another term, but you can see some good examples here of how that's done. And that term for uh, lowering the flat where you clear the stage and put your foot on it. Remember that's called footing it. If someone says, hey, could you foot that flat? You just put your foot at the bottom of it so it doesn't slide out. And then you float it down here. You can see the term. Lower it down by floating it. Now, of course, if there's something really heavy and big, then somebody will foot it and you'll walk it down. That's another way. But once you get these flats up on the stage, then you need to assemble them. And frequently, because there are many different flats and often they're straight in a row, you add stiffeners to the back. And this could be a batten like that or just a piece of one by on edge. And then you can brace them with a jack brace or a stage brace. And these are flexible extenders that get screwed into the floor. Usually on a jack brace, you drop a sandbag across the bottom or something to hold it there. You can also lash flats from behind. You can see here, basically the two flats that are coming together in a corner have cleats on them and a rope always hangs from a screw eye or a lash eye. And then you take the rope after you put them together and tie it off and it cinches them together. This is old world stuff. Mostly people use screw guns now and make hardcover flats. If you go to brace, as I mentioned before, you can use a jack brace and drop a sandbag across it. Notice it's a little more than 90 degrees, so it's leaning back, so it doesn't want to fall over quite as easily. Audience wouldn't generally detect something like that. But as I say, a lot of scenery these days is done with hardcover flats. You can see they've made sort of temporary braces just to hold things up with a piece of one by probably just screwed that into the floor maybe with a L bracket or some kind of loose pin hinge or something like that. You can also have larger walls and these could be hardcover flats if you need to move them into place. And in that instance, use a tip jack. So when you're rolling it, it's tipped back on itself so it doesn't want to fall over. And then when you put it into place, it leans forward and comes off of the wheels. Pretty handy. Here's an example of how that works. So you roll it and then tip it forward once it's to, you know, to hold it in place. Another way of changing sceneries that's related to flats is to use a periactoi, and this goes way back to the Greeks, hence the word. And basically, they are triangles. You put together tall, thin flats, and you put something at the center so they'll spin. You can kind of see how these have a pipe at the top and the bottom, and then they spin round. These then also have flats behind them. Uh, to move to reveal the different changes. And basically then you get three different sides that you can use different images configured. Let me show you an example. The first time I saw it was in the musical A Chorus Line, which dates back to the 1970s. Let's take a look at this in motion. So a lot of the scenes take place in the rehearsal hall. So you see them dancing in front of mirrors. 
Now, in this instance, I think, even though the image is fairly small, they've flown in some extra mirrors to really get her image kind of bouncing around on stage. But later on in the show, the performers come on, and it, again, it's as though they're in the rehearsal hall there with the mirrors as they would when they dance. But then for the finale of the show, they all drop back into place and... That whole background image is back there all the time. You just never see it because of the way those hairy actors are spun around. Let's take a look at some LED video screens. This is a really high-tech 21st century way to do it. Pretty amazing what happens. Kind of intrigued by the uh, imagery here. They have time clocks on them so that the programmers know what's happening here. It's synchronized. You see how they drop into place so the audience gets to see two sides on each one. These things are massive. You can see the small monitors down here. You can tell how big these things are. You can program that computer to give you a continuous image across the two. It's a big flat, and then you can use the technology to cross fade. And then as they spin round, you can do more. Again, depending on how you programmed it. So things like that animation really comes to life. Just want to show you one more. There's this crazy effect coming up. <laughs> Pretty nutsy stuff. <laughs> well, if you want to see some more of it, you can certainly take a look at the PowerPoint yourself and go as fast or as slow as you like. So another way that scenery changes is to use something called wings and drops, and these. This example that you're going to see here, um, this is a top view of the stage. Here's the proscenium arch, and here's a 3D example of what you're looking at. But basically what the scene designers do would paint different scenes on different flats, and they're run from slots in the floor, and then you have a backdrop here, and that also changes so that you can change the scenic view. Here's a video of the Drottingholm Slot Theater, which is in Stockholm, Sweden. And as the slide says, it's one of the few 18th century theaters um, that still has that original machinery there in Europe. Um, so the, from the 1700s here, take a look at this video. Ah, 1766. It's interesting because the actors do most of the scene changes as well. Watch how it magically transforms one location to the next. And here they are under the stage moving it all. And if you notice, it's a lot of ropes and that thing they were spinning is called a capstan. And that would be the same kind of technology from wooden ships in, back in the day. A lot of sailors working on scenery, doing this kind of rigging, dreaming up how to do it. They also didn't mind the heights going way up into a theater. Isn't that amazing how stuff falls down? That's a wind machine. So a wooden drum and it has a piece of canvas on it. That's a rain machine. There's stones in there rolling and so it sounds like it's raining during a storm, scenery moving through slots in the floor. I love how it's all synchronized. Notice the lighting in this as well. Chandeliers above, footlights below. <laughs> it's 
great stuff. Well, let's keep going. So let's talk more about how scenery is flown because that's another way to do it, um, to do scene changes. Many, many theaters have space and equipment to be able to fly scenery in and out. So typically what you find above the stage is either metal girders, I-beams running across or a grid, which basically runs um, with slots, uh, steel. Seldom are these things made of wood anymore. In the old days they were, but now it's all made of steel and you put the pulleys up here and you rig where you run all the cables together. Each one goes, spreads along the batten. And these days there's a, they're metal pipes. Again, seldom wood anymore in this day and age much stronger and safer. And then all those cables come together, either into a sandbag, and they go and are tied off at a pin rail, or they go into arbors along the side of the stage. And that's where you put your counterweight. So the weight on the two is always equal. So let's take a look at that. Here's the grid running across the top. It's got loft blocks, upside down pulleys, very large. These are cables. Here's the pipe or the batten you put the load on. And then it's got a head block where all those lines come together and they come to the top of the arbor. And then there's another cable that loops around the whole contraption here. And there's a way to lock it off and you make these two, the weight equal there. So there's also a loading rail up high so that when this pipe or batten is down here, you can change the weight up here because the arbor is going to be up at the top when the pipe's at the bottom and vice versa. That way, all that weight doesn't come crashing down when you take the load off of it. So you're always looking for equal balance. Here's some more images of the fly system. If there isn't a grid, which is what you see here, somebody's standing up on the grid and you can see those loft blocks running along with all the cable. Then they've put I-beams up here and hung them from the underside. Harder to get at, because boy, you gotta climb up there somehow. Get a genie lift or something. Um, but it is less expensive because you don't need all that steel on the grid. Here then it are some pipes and different battens. And you can see where over on the side of the theater you open the lock and can fly the scenery in and out. Here's the lock rail itself. Each of these are numbered. And usually there's 12, 6, 12, 18 inches between them. Um, and you can code them, label them up. Here again is with all those battens flown down and you're up in a space above the stage called the fly gallery. So again, I just can't stress this enough. When you're working down on the stage, changing the weight, either adding things or taking them off, you want somebody up on the loading bridge changing the weight into the arbor. So these things are always equal because this little break down here, it's strong, but not super strong. Let's take a look at a video from the Rao Center for the Arts out in Illinois. Um, they explain flying scenery. Cook. I'm the director of production here at the Rouse Center. I'm Lindsay Wolf. I'm the sound supervisor here at the Rouse Center. We've been asked today to take you through a little bit backstage and talk to you about our counterweight system. Uh, if you've ever wondered what the giant seven-story fly tower or monolith in downtown Crystal Lake is, that is in fact what it is. You can see it from pretty much everywhere in the surrounding area is so that if we have a 25-foot curtain that we want to bring in so that you can see it. We need 25 feet above, above the proscenium line to be able to hide that so that it can go away. There's the stage and then we have curtains, we have movie screens, we've got lighting instruments and everything else that have to go out of the way back in and this is how we do it. Uh, everything is on a batten or a large pipe in the sky and this is our counterweight. You can see it here. 
So everything that's on a pipe up there weighs a certain amount. So we have to counterbalance that on the other end of the ropes that go all the way across with this giant steel weight here to make sure that it moves smoothly back and forth and doesn't run away. This is your brake. You flip the brake, you get it started. And right now I'm gonna bring in the movie screen, I believe. Yeah. They put a camera on the arbor, so you're watching the whole arbor go up along the wall there. And then you lock it back off again. When it's time to fly it out, unlock, you pull on the back rope instead and bring the counterweight back down. So if you've got a 700 pound curtain or a 1200 pound curtain, as long as you have 700 or 1200 pounds on this end as well, it doesn't take much effort to slide it back and forth. It, as opposed to trying to do it just manually, which would take five or six people to try and haul. That's how it works from here. Okay. So one of the things, uh, and I believe John talks about this because we just don't have enough space to fly scenery out, but I suppose it's also true at Syracuse stage, they probably trip some scenery there because their fly tower could be a little higher <laughs> compared to the opening of the proscenium. But nevertheless, to try to get scenery out, you may end up using a term called tripping. And the first example over here, number one on the left, is to add a pipe along the bottom. You've of course got your pipe at the top that's holding the drape or the psych, but then you put lines on both of those and pull them up. And so it doubles over on itself. You could have another pipe or a batten across the back and third it if you needed to. Um, that makes it even shorter. You could also make some hardcover scenery at the bottom and make the top of it soft so that once you pull that up, the rest trips out um, so that you, it's much easier to fly that scenery. Let's take a look at the National Theater. They put some great videos out to explain the kind of system that they have. The National Theater is there in London. Their main stage is called the Olivier. Um, it's huge, seats many, many, many people. I forget exactly how many, a thousand maybe, maybe more. Um, and uh, they've got some incredible equipment the facility was so well built um, back in the day when it was originated. Um, they, it seems like they didn't spare any expense. A lot of the videos on this PowerPoint are from the National Theater. Let's take a look. Here's a tour, a backstage tour. Welcome to the National Theater. Let's go inside and have a look around. The National Theatre is open to everyone. People come here from all over the world to watch plays, see exhibitions and take part in workshops. Over 800,000 people visit the National Theatre each year. Before actors go on stage, they change into their costumes in a dressing room, like this one. Their dressing room is also a place they can relax between the afternoon show, called the matinee, and the evening show. For a play shown to an audience, the actors need to rehearse, and they do that here, in the rehearsal room. It's where everyone in the company gets to know each other, and works out what they're going to be doing on stage. This is Drum Road, the pathway that connects all the backstage workshops. One of the special things about the National Theatre is that almost everything you see on stage has been made right here in this building. This is the Metal Workshop. It's where they make metal frames for the sets so that they're strong enough to carry all the weight of lots of people and objects. Next is the Carpentry Workshop, where the wooden parts of the set are built. Every play has a designer and a director who tell the workshop teams what they want the set to look like. The workshop teams then figure out how to make those ideas a reality. After the different parts of the set have been made, they're put together. The team here might be making anything. A giant table, an army tank, a boat, or a whole house. This is where the scenic artists work. 
They're the very last people to work on the scenery before it goes onto the stage. They draw, paint and add texture to help the audience believe in the world they see on stage. This is the props workshop. These skilled craftspeople are expert makers. They can build furniture, puppets, pretend food, statues, the range is endless. Here, in the costume department, they make everything an actor wears on stage, including wigs and masks. The costume makers have to make sure everything a character wears is just right for the time period and setting of the play. Many actors say they don't really feel like their character until they have their costume on, so that first fitting is really important. As we approach the stage, you'll see the deputy stage manager. It's her job to cue everyone working on the show, telling actors when to go on and the technical teams when to change the lights and play the sound effects. After all this hard work, it's finally time to take to the stage. This is the Olivier Theatre and it seats over 1,000 people. Imagine how it must feel to step out and perform on this stage. I hope you've enjoyed your tour of the National Theatre. There are actually more spaces there and I'll show you another video from an alternate performance space um, called the Littleton, but this is the Olivier and I wanted to show you what's possible there. This is how they fly scenery. So instead of a bunch of battens uh, and a typical fly house, take a look at this. This is the Olivier power flying system. Unlike the Lithson flying system, we have conventional bars. We have 127 point hoists, uh, which can be individually controlled and take a load of 200 kilos. What we can do is we can track these stage left and right. We can group them together to create bars, or we can even group them together to fly 3D pieces of scenery. This is where we operate the flying system during the show. We're about halfway up with the fly tower here, which gives us a really good vantage point of what is going on on stage. We also have the infrared cameras, which allow us to see during blackouts to see where the actors are on stage as well. Because the system is computerized, we can plot the cues beforehand, and then all we have to do during the show is press the go button. This is the Olivier grid. We're nine stories above the stage here, and it's actually the highest point inside the National Theatre. What we have up here is the motor assemblies, which drive each individual hoist. It's amazing how fast or slow those things go. So another way of moving scenery is to put it on a wagon or a rolling platform. Notice that there are some that are very low to the ground. And these can roll straight or you can move, put move, movable, mobile swivel casters. That's the word I'm looking for so that they can go anywhere on the stage. If you want higher platforms, you just build underneath to give it the structure. But then one of the questions is how do you stop them? And one of the best ways I think um, if you can do it, is to add some stairs or something that drops down into place. You can also drop pins or you can put brakes on the back that lift part of the wagon up in the air. Some stages, and here we're looking at an example um, uh, of a very large theater space, but some stages have a lot of storage in the wings. So you can get big wagons left and right and roll them on and upstage as well. And we're gonna take a look at one of those examples. They tend to do that uh, kind of scenic change at the National Theater in the Littleton and they'll show you, but basically they can put wagons left and right. So you're here in the audience watching the stage and here's the proscenium opening. And then you can push these wagons in either from upstage to down or left to right. Let's take a peek at how this mechanically works. Oftentimes what they do is either have an electric motor or a hand cranked motor with the cable underneath the stage and then a groove cut into it with a little dog that pulls along and catches and holds on to that wagon. 
This is especially helpful if you've got something like a rock concert and you're trying to get between bands really quick. You get a number of these roll, low rolling stages and you can pile on all the equipment and the drum kit or whatever and roll it on and roll the next one off. So it works quite well. Wagons can also pivot in from a corner. Um, and in, if that's the case, they're called jackknife wagons. And you can see because it has one pivot point, the whole wagon just flips down into place and then it pushes back off stage again. And it's very easy to stabilize these things and to control them because they're just swinging in and out. Here again is another example of how those full stage slip wagons work left and right up and down stage. Let's take a look at how this works in the Littleton Theater, which is smaller than the Olivier. It's a proscenium theater. We're standing on the set of the White Guard, which is one of the biggest shows we've had here for many years. Um, it's very challenging in many ways, is that we have three big scene changes in the show. It's so designed for the Littleton in, at the National Theater. It's so it's kind of site specific almost to, to the to what's provided by the Littleton, the war, the machinery of war, that it felt like a big piece of machinery kind of trundling along, that there was something unstoppable about the evening and using the whole mechanics of the Littleton felt quite appropriate. The first change that we have goes from the apartment to the palace. There's two characters left on stage, one of whom is extremely drunk. And he's left on stage and he begins to kind of uh, stagger about the stage as the wagon begins to move. One of the main challenges uh, for this was to get this wagon itself, which is operated on hydraulics, automated, which we managed to do over a few weeks of, uh, of uh, head scratching. Now it's up, on and up and running. It's a very spectacular scene change. The whole feeling of it is, is that the whole world is, is spinning and the audience watching it for a moment, I think, thinks, what's happening? And then, uh, similarly, the lighting, there's a moment where we get to a cross cut, where we shift from the look of the apartment interior. Suddenly, we cross cut into side lighting that Neil Austin's done and the, the palace is revealed and characters appear setting up the palace furniture and also with the music that there's a the, the music works together with that you tell the story kind of visually and in a soundscape and through the actions of the character. If you have a clever director who, and, and, and a good team behind him, it's amazing how you can cheat people so that you make them look in one direction and meanwhile something else quite big is happening. When they look back they think, where did that go? Where's, where's that? How's that happened? And um, that's kind of fun because it's a bit like magic, isn't it? That's what magicians do. <laughs> I love those watching that furniture come up through the floor. Let's watch a scene change at the Littleton. One of the things that happens at the National Theater is they do shows in rep, meaning they keep several going and they'll run a show for a week or two, sometimes three, and then they change it over and they'll do a different show and then they go back to the other show. Um, sometimes theaters change them over um, in a day so that say over the weekend you might have two or three shows that you're moving in and out of the same space you have to store them and coordinate everything and you'll see here how the lights change while they're moving scenery they're testing and making sure all the lights are programmed because a lot of these instruments are movable they're automated so they'll go where you need them to so lighting is checking and making sure everything's good while the scenery is changing as well. Another way to change scenery, and we're almost done here, I guess it's related to wagons, is a turntable. And you can see in this instance, the audience is looking through the proscenium and the turntable is so large that there are three different sets. And when this revolves, 
you get a different set dropping into place. But again, you're not really aware of those. If you are, you're looking out. They also have a big sky cloth back here. You can see a big cyclorama, it's called, that wraps around. Here's a model of a turntable with the set surrounding it. Here's an example of a theater that's built, building one into their auditorium. You can see they've taken out some seats to be able to do this. But I wanted to show you what happens in the Olivier, um, because once again, at this very large theater in the National Theater in London, um, they went even further. They built this giant uh, turntable into the stage. Take a look. If you've ever been to the Olivier Theatre, you may wonder why you have to climb three flights of stairs just to get into the stalls. Well, the reason for this is beneath the stage is uh, what we call the drum revolve, and it's five stories deep all the way down to the car park. Um, basically, what the drum revolve um, is, is is a normal standard revolve, but the designers, when they originally built the building, wanted something more versatile. So what the designers came up with was a large piece of machinery that you could actually lower the stage as well. So we ended up having elevators inside the drum revolve. Well, we can build set on top of the elevators, um, so we can raise things out of the stage. We've had towers, we've had boats, but all sorts raising out of the stage. We can then sink things into the stage and revolve round and bring up a, a bear set so we can make things disappear very quickly. We can do it within a minute. And the machinery, because we are five stories below the stages, is very quiet down here. Take a look at this example. Um, there's no sound with it or anything, but this is one set for a show and they put LED screens into part of it. I'm just trying to imagine being an actor up there without any railings, but I guess the deck is really big, so they're all right. It moves very slow. This is time-lapse. They get those actors off up top as well. Set comes out of the ground like that. And then these crazy looking images that are projected on there on the video screens. And I love how it turns so that scenery comes on, but also actors walk in place. It, it appears as though they're really traveling. Look how the scenery flies. They've flown in a, a star drop there. And then out that goes and in comes the interior from below. And then a bunch of dancers up top. It's amazing looking. Wow. And that's only part of it. One show, Treasure Island, they have a three-story ship that comes up and out of the drum revolve. What I wanted to do, though, is show you one final video. And this is in the Littleton. It's the same set designer as the one that you saw earlier. Bunny Christie is her name. And she uses those wagons to even more dramatic effect. Take a look at this. When they have all the resources, it's amazing what they can do. My name is uh, Dave Tuff. I'm the stage supervisor uh, for the Littleton Theatre and uh, I'm the stage OA uh, for Red Barn, so I run the stage crew during the shows. I'm Yuri Kiroz, I'm a stage technician at the National Theatre and on Red Barn I am the key man uh, for the show. I'm Eddie Hardin, I'm stage crew at the National Theatre and I'm also the deputy key man. The Red Barn is a 12-man stage crew show. Having that amount of bodies on stage requires a lot of coordination that we're not running over each other. We don't only just move the trucks, we also set the scenes with all the, the props and furniture on them as well. Um, so it's a very complicated process. With the sliders slowly closing, obviously that gives us something that we can sort of hide behind when we're setting scenes. So you might be sort of looking at Donald on the stage in a blizzard, 
um, unbeknown to you as the slide is coming from stage left, we're trucking along with one of our trucks. When they open and close, it allows us to set the scenes directly behind them, but it also gives the visual impression of uh, a cinematic world tracking and panning through the, the scenes as they play out. I'm Bunny Christian, the set and costume designer of The Red Barn. I really like this one. <laughs> it's kind of fun to do. Who knew you could get grey balloons? <laughs> I think people out um, in the audience probably think it's all much more kind of computerised and mechanised than it actually is. It's all, a lot of it is, you know, brute force and strong guys and their skill at kind of riding the wagons you know it's really exciting when you see them and they get them up to top speed and then they're stopping right on a mark i'm generally on the farmhouse um the farmhouse you'll see more than any other truck mainly the farmhouse is the one that's coming on and off which is probably the fastest moving one so this show is a little bit different and as we have we've got this we're using the side stage so we've got the stage left shutter open that's where we have the farmhouse coming on and off from so this is the this is the farmhouse truck. The the play is set in 1969, um, but we wanted a kind of feeling that in this farmhouse it's got quite a 50s kind of feel to it, and it's a mixture of sort of Connecticut farmhouse and then things that they've done to the farmhouse to to kind of do a conversion. And it has a very sort of clean, quite a sparse feeling to it. It's like nothing's out of place. It's um it's kind of Ingrid's world where everything is kind of immaculate. It's quite an austere feel, it's quite stylish, but there's, it's not uh, massively cosy, I suppose. You never see any nature apart from when we're in the blizzard. So the windows are intentionally always got a kind of blizzard film on them. So it feels like there's a kind of blankness outside of the, all the interiors. So you never see any uh, greenery or nature or trees or sky or, so it's got a kind of abstracted although it's quite naturalistic it's also slightly abstracted feel to it. we do quite a lot of stuff behind what you know where you're watching a bit of the show we're setting another scene stripping out an entire truck and re putting different props on it which very silently um, which is uh, which took some rehearsing at the uh, at the start as you can see, when everything's in, it's absolutely kind of chock-a-block, the layers of stuff. It is like a game of treacherous. We're kind of like, you know, if, we, if I make one thing slightly bigger, then I would have to make something smaller. And I always wanted the, the kind of New York uh, apartment to feel as if Donald had gone to heaven. So it's like when he steps into that apartment, it's full of light and air. Again, we cover, so we covered the windows with this kind of gauzy, film so that the it's again it's got a kind of blizzardy snowy feel to it for a designer the lighting is absolutely crucial so when i'm designing i'm i'm always light than my model boxes I, I never work in my model box without having them lit and i'll always be sort of thinking of um where the light source would be some of the world of the theater is really really high tech but then we have, you know, a lot of it is absolutely human based, human skill, and, um, and, the, and the crew are, are fantastically important to all of that. And it's really satisfying when the show starts to dance because they're, you're literally, you know, like as one thing moves into place, the other one's just moved out of place and an actor steps off the set and then it whizzes off into the wings and then they're doing a quick change and then they run around and the other thing is just there as they step onto it, the apertures are opening. That's just so satisfying. It's so satisfying for everybody because it's like an orchestra when everything starts all playing together. That's the most exciting bit really of uh, making, a, making a show like this that's all about you know, scene changes. There's the demand these days uh, from designers to produce something that um, no one's ever seen before or do something in a different way. So we're forever pushing the boundaries of what's uh, possible within the space we have. Um, which is one of the one of the good things about working at National. We feel a pride in your work. You know, you put a lot of effort into the things we do here at the National. And with every show, every single one that I've worked on since I've been here, I always find uh, a sense of achievement out of all of them. 
you know that you've done something that people have come away from and enjoyed and they'll talk about for, for years to come. Boy, that must have taken a lot of rehearsal. <laughs> so that's the end of this presentation about changing scenery. I hope you enjoyed it.